So, uh, well, welcome everyone to the AI East Bay Regional and Urban Design Forum. We do a monthly program and um, you have found us this month. So thank you. A um, few things coming up that we are, are having go on, which is in August on the third, let's see, third Thursday of every month we do the RUD. So third Thursday of August, we're having Warren Logan from the mayor's office speak on slow streets. I think that'd be a very interesting presentation, um, just the implement, implementation of that in Oakland, uh, where they've shut down streets to uh, allow pedestrian um, access to them. And then we're working on a really interesting program coming up with uh, Connor Doherty, who wrote a book on housing of, of, of California and the kind of history of it. Um, so that's probably going to be in October, but maybe September. Um, just keep an eye out on our AIA East Bay website and we'll, yeah, you'll find us. Um, Spur, in, in regards to this presentation, Spur is doing a, really, a couple of really interesting programs coming up on housing. Uh, tomorrow, they're doing a presentation called What is California Doing About Housing? On the 21st of July, they're doing a presentation on treating housing as an essential infrastructure. And then on July 23rd, they're doing planning, zoning, legislation to enable the missing middle housing. So um, just to follow up on this housing as intervention program, I think all of those would probably be wonderful programs to, uh, to do. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Tyler, who uh, helped put this all together with Karen and for the introduction of Karen. Oh, I have two more things, sorry, sorry. Uh, one more thing, or uh, two more things. Uh, First, uh, this is being recorded, so just for your information. And secondly, at the bottom of this app, there's a chat window. So if you have questions, uh, we'll be looking at them and trying to feed them back in. And at the end, there will be an open discussion, which will probably be kind of led through the chat window. So feel free throughout the presentation to um, ask questions and comments away. Uh, Tyler. Tyler, please go and introduce. Hey, everybody. Um, okay, so we have a speaker today. Um, uh, Karen is uh, joining us from Oregon. Karen QB is a, um, she's an urbanist and a uh, kind of a a dear friend of um, someone who uh, is sort of around our circles, who works for Evald C. Annie Ledbury. That's how I first met her. And she talked to Karen when I was um, thinking about um, what was housing and how the city was going to change right at the beginning of COVID in, um, in March and early April. And she unequivocally recommended Karen right off the bat. And... Um, <laughs> And she used to be, I believe, co-chair with Annie um, of um, Architecture for Humanity in New York for the New York chapter. And um, they've each gone their separate ways since then. And so I'll leave the rest of the introduction of where her background's been since then or the work that she's doing to Karen. And uh, thanks, Karen, for joining us today and leading our little talk we do once a month. Sure thing. Yes, thank you so, so much for inviting me. And um, I'm glad to see those of you who are brave enough to put on your cameras. And I hope that please, please, like if you need to do your hair or something, please do it because um, when we come into the discussion, I definitely would love to see everyone's faces. It makes this... Um, makes it a little less weird, right, to be able to see everyone. Um, so I might, um, I might jump into my slides. I'll introduce myself um, through the presentation. Um, so let me, let me just do that. Okay. Hold on. I was doing Zoom constantly during school, and now... Um, okay. All right. Right. So, so the talk today is titled "Housing as Intervention," and 
As mentioned, um, I'm just finishing up a year as a fellow in design for spatial justice at the University of Oregon. Um, and this is what I'm hoping we can do today, uh, have a conversation around the role of architects and architecture in fighting injustice. And um, specifically looking at this moment, how can architects best promote greater health equity and affordable housing for all? So I'm in Oregon, but I'm from California. And I went to Berkeley, uh, go Bears, for anyone who also attended the institution down the road. Um, and um, now I'm, I'm calling you from Portland, Oregon. And, um, and yeah, I've just had the pleasure. I'm part of a new uh, initiative here at the University of Oregon um, called this fellowship in, in design for spatial justice. So I'm showing you an image from a Zoom conversation that um, centered on students at the university and also included some presentations by me and my fellow fellows. Um, so spatial justice, um, you know, basically looks at how social justice shows up in the built environment or doesn't. Um, so I'm one of six people who have been here this year as part of a three-year initiative. Uh, all of our research aligns with spatial justice and we've been doing teaching related to that. And in between these two things, I spent 16 years in New York. Um, I wasn't the co-chair of Architecture for Humanity, but I did help to found um, the, the New York chapter. Um, I also used to run an organization called the Institute for Public Architecture. And I began my career as um, a designer of affordable housing. Um, so my talk today will be brief and it will be in two parts, uh, housing for health and housing for intervention. And, and yes, please definitely interrupt me. It'll be awesome if we get to the end of this and there, I mean, you can talk, you can, you know, it's, it's loose. I hope you're having a drink during this. Um, so, so interrupt me as, as you want and definitely please, please, please put your questions in the chat because it will be um, excellent to, to finish this portion and have um, a lot of material to go on. And um, anyone who loves tweeting, <laughs> I'm, I'm at Karen QB on all of the platforms. Okay, all right, here we go. Um, and then I'll just say, you know, sometimes when I'm presenting, it's hard for me to see the chat. So, so if I need to know anything urgently, just say it out loud so I can hear you. Okay, all right, so housing for health. So this describes sort of why, you know, why I get up in the morning and, and, and um, try to contribute to the work that I'm contributing to. Um, so, you know, as I said, most of my work, 16 years, has been in New York. So I'm referencing some statistics from there. So in East Harlem, the life expectancy is 76 years old. The Upper East Side, which is directly south of there, it's 85 years old. So we have a gap of nine years um, in New York. And for those who aren't familiar, these are, these are directly adjacent neighborhoods. Um, and unfortunately, I'm sure you'll be unsurprised to learn that there's a big gap in, in um, incomes. There's a correlation between life expectancy and incomes, and, and also um, a difference in, in the racial makeup of these two neighborhoods, Upper East Side being, being much whiter, and East Harlem being a community largely of people of color. Um, and, and then looking at how, you know, more maps that are unfortunately quite similar, looking at um, obesity and diabetes rates, um, differentials in those uh, two neighborhoods. Um, and then, you know, this, this slide, of course, uh, is a pre-COVID slide, um, but looking at why are we worried about this? We're worried about this because as opposed to, you know, 100 plus years ago, when we were worried about things like TB, either it's these chronic diseases that, that are killing us and are um, related to our built environment. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm always sort of surprised by this. You would think it would be 
genetics or access to healthcare, those are things, of course, are critical, but actually the best predictor of our health is where we live. Um, so looking at a map showing that it's not just, you know, magically those two neighborhoods, but unfortunately these patterns of inequality, um, you know, are, are correlated with uh, race and income across the city and across the country. And so the concept that my work centers on is health equity. And I like to use this definition by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is quite simple, which means health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthier. So I'm sharing just a tiny bit of uh, my work. This is the first project that uh, got me interested in the relationship between uh, our work as architects and um, health equity. So I, um, I led a steering committee for a, a competition called New Housing New York that was uh, eventually sponsored by AI New York and by the city of New York. Um, and what you're seeing is the a uh, winning project that was built called Via Verde in the Bronx. Uh, the the um, architects on that were, were Jatner and Grimshaw. So this was a competition where the initial idea was uh, to, you know, produce something that was both sustainable and affordable at a time when those two words represented different camps. Uh, and we said, you know, actually, we need to raise the standards of affordable housing. It needs to be environmentally sustainable. But what's important is that the project actually went beyond what we were considering. Via Verde, of course, means the green way. And um, from a shared courtyard, you can actually walk up a series of green roofs. There's a health clinic on the ground floor. There's cross-ventilation, um, healthy materials. There's a, a whole range of um, healthy aspects to this building, to this development. And it became a test case for the city's active design guidelines, uh, which looked at how can, uh, how can we promote physical activity and health in design. Um, this is sort of a classic example. You know, if, if your stairs are beautiful like this, then people are um, more likely to take them and get a little bit of exercise than the elevator. Of course, you know, we, this would never um, discount uh, important accessibility um, aspects, but, but providing uh, alternatives. Uh, the city is now working on new guidelines, which are more holistic, but this was a really important moment. And for me in my career, looking at, um, you know, how, how we might make, make a contribution. Um, and I'm quite interested in uh, how better and better research is coming out to support this. Um, what I'm showing right now is what I consider perhaps the only silver lining of the fact that in New York, like, like many places, there is a totally absurd uh, waiting list for affordable housing such that when a new building comes online and has you know, 50 units of affordable housing, literally like 10,000 people will sign up. Um, and try to get units. And so that means it creates a natural uh, experiment where the city followed people of the same sort of demographics, some of whom got into a better quality uh, and more affordable housing or housing uh, that's 30% or less of their income. Um, and then compared those against people who did not, who were, who were stuck in their unaffordable, likely lower quality housing. So looking at um, you know, how this is quite uh, direct, um, where you know, your housing is, is, your health is affected by um, unaffordable housing and for those lucky enough to um, have affordable housing and better quality, your mental health gets better, your physical health gets better, you're missing less school and less work. It's a, it's a critical um, intervention um, in your health. Um, and then just to give an example, I've had um, most of my, my, I mean, my work has um, basically has three categories. I teach and I write and um, I consult on projects around spatial justice, uh, often with city agencies as clients, but a range of clients. And this is one of the projects that I've done with the city of New York, um, looking at, you know, there are particular populations, of course, that have different health 
issues. And this is a project that was looking at um, how uh, seniors who are aging in place can be supported. Um, and I was surprised to learn that something like 90%, don't quote me on an exact figure, but something like 90% of seniors actually aging, age in place, meaning that they're staying in their apartments and not going to a, um, you know, a purpose-built facility. So, so how can we make sure that they're healthy and safe? So this is kind of a dream project because I'm showing you the amazing group of people I got to work with, experts in um, uh, public health, in um, design for disabilities. Um, and our task was, you know, AARP actually has excellent guidance, very, very good actually, on, on how to upgrade uh, single family homes, but that's not what um, urban housing stock looks like. So we were tasked with um, uh, expanding that kind of guidance for, for multifamily, everything from a, you know, a two apartment uh, duplex up to the biggest apartment building and, and find, trying to make it quite simple. Um, so this is looking at specifically uh, reducing the risk of falls and also um, reducing the risk of social isolation, which we know um, contributes to a depression. So looking at how um, we can design our buildings to be safer physically and also um, to promote social behavior. So that's just a tiny, tiny, tiny glimpse into a couple of moments in my uh, career, just to give you a little sense of who I am. And um, so the second uh, half of the presentation um, draws from a book that I edited called Housing as Intervention that was published by AD or Architectural Design. That's the British uh, publication that's been around since 1930. So um, this was... Uh, this is a collection of 17 essays uh, from around the world that I edited um, that was on, on this question. Um, so, you know, the first question might be, why, Karen, are you so obsessed with housing? And um, my argument and the reason I keep working on this stuff is um, that housing's primary position in our lives you know, especially under COVID, we're home all the time. But even in normal times, you know, um, it's such an important, you know, we're, we're home more than anywhere else. It's such an important part of our identity. Uh, it's primary position in our economies. You know, when the housing market collapses, so does the rest of the economy. And then the built environment, right? If we're interested in improving neighborhoods, of course, the majority of building stock is, is housing. So my argument is those three things makes housing a natural site of intervention in the complex fight against systemic injustices. So for each of the 17 essays, there were two questions I asked the writers to address. One is, how can housing projects and the design processes behind them be interventions towards greater social equity? And I kept the definition of social equity quite broad so that Different articles could drill down on the racial equity, economic equity, health equity, gender equity, whatever were the, you know, the issues they were most directly addressing, they could, they could drill down on that. And then the second question is, is quite related to what I hope we will focus on today, uh, which is in the face of persistent social inequities worldwide, how can architects make a meaningful contribution? So I'll begin by framing it with architecture for another housing crisis. Why do I have that in quotes? Um, you know, it's not so long ago. Somehow it's 12 years ago. But, uh, you know, of course, we're still feeling the effects of the housing crisis, you know, the foreclosure, mortgage crisis, um, and more long term, especially looking in Western conditions, um, you know, we're seeing disinvestment and in, in public housing and privatization. Um, but the so-called housing shortage is not something peculiar to the present. On the contrary, all oppressed classes in all periods suffered more or less uniformly from it, which is to say, you know, it's, it's some of this housing crisis is, is now being talked about because it's, you know, affecting more people, but unfortunately um, for some, 
people. It's, it, it's a constant crisis. Um, and some of you, I know there are some pretty smart people on the call. Uh, you might recognize this. This is not new. This is from 1872, Frederick Engels. Um, so, so a lot of this is, is definitely not new, unfortunately, and um, it's a chronic issue. Um, but some of it is, is newer looking at the scale of the crisis and, and why am I showing this? Why am I showing this image where uh, there's a fire starting in a homeless encampment and um, destroying some houses in Bel Air? Why, why would I possibly focus on people in Bel Air of all things? I mean, I'm sure they're lovely, but they have a lot of money. Um, I focus on that because I think if we look historically at moments like this, uh, where there were crowded conditions. Um, uh, you know, here's an image by Jacob Rees. We're looking at uh, a tenement in the Lower East Side. Um, and this is a moment where we're, you know, worried about issues like uh, tuberculosis, et cetera. And this is a moment where uh, there's a design competition. Uh, this is a so-called dumbbell apartment that's produced as the winner. Um, and the innovations are bringing in light and air around the stair core and um, basically making sure that the building doesn't take up the entire block. So there's some light and air here and um, through the back. And this gets codified into um, the first building codes in, in New York uh, so that all, you know, all housing thereafter has to have um, a certain amount of light and air. And I bring this up because um, Oftentimes when you hear about this, it's told as a story like, oh, you know, the benevolent government wanted to make sure that the poor were well housed. Um, but actually, if you dig into it, it's because, you know, people in neighboring neighborhoods uh, with more money and more political power were worried that a disease would uh, come to them. And so, and so because it was such a crisis moment, um, there was an opportunity to to raise the standards of housing for everyone. Um, and then another thing that I think is really interesting is, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people on the call who've been working in housing for a long time, working in so-called public interest design, um, and thinking about how this is no longer sort of esoteric, no longer off to the side, but how, you know, this kind of work by Elemental Arvena um, wins the Pitzker Prize, right? So the biggest prize in our, our field um, goes to affordable housing, goes to public interest design. So um, now I'll show you some examples. I cut it down quite a lot, but I'll show you, let's see, one, two, three. I'll show you four examples in three categories. Um, this is how we broke it down in the book. You know, how do you think about such a large thing like social equity and architecture? Uh, we broke this into three categories collaborative approaches, new forms of housing, and a new kind of architect. Um, so as I'm talking about this, um, I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about how these might intersect with your work, what's already going on in the Bay Area, um, or you know, what questions or ideas it brings up for you. So collaborative approaches. Um, so I'll start in Philadelphia with this very beautiful project by ISA called Powerhouse. Um, so I could talk about ISA's work in sort of normal <laughs> architecture ways, right? Like this beautiful brick. I could, you know, look at these nice stairs. Uh, you know, I could I could talk about I could talk about things in a you know a lot of different ways, right? But instead, what I want to do is pull uh, open the curtain of the so we can see behind it to look at how ISA um, has approached this work. And I'm really interested in their collaborative approach where they work with, um, maybe some of you know her, uh, Rupal Songbi of a firm called Health by Design. Um, she's trained in public health and, and works on the built environment. Um, so they work closely with her in collaboration with her and her firm um, to look at how their work as architects can promote health equity. Um, this is a proposal for Brooklyn. Of course, Philadelphia, unfortunately, also has um, sees racial inequities in, in health outcomes. Um, so here we see, you know, I, I spoke very briefly about active design, um, but we see um, a proposal that has, you know, uh, a lot of infrastructure for, for walking, for exercise, and for access to uh, green space. 
And then thinking through, okay, what does this really mean and how can we approach this through a scientific lens? Um, so looking at the different tools that architects might have, the different changes that might be able to ma be made in a design, and what are the real outcomes for health? And something I think about is, you know, um, let's say you're, you're involved in designing a new neighborhood and, and you might think, oh, you know, if we include a park, um, that will encourage people to be more physically active and healthier. You know, Rupa will just go in there and say, well, yes, but only if it's, you know, 2.3 acres because otherwise it won't serve the catchment area. So, so looking at real specifics um, so that architects can get better and better, you know, in, in collaborating with their clients um, and figuring out what changes will actually make a difference in people's lives. And then going across the ocean to London, um, looking at a project uh, by Kara Krusevich, Carson Architects. Um, so in London, as you may know, after many years um, of privatization and disinvestment, you know, parallel to what goes on in the United States, they've actually been building uh, what they call, you know, we would call it public housing, they call it social housing. Um, they've started building after the crash, um, direct, direct building. Um, so here again, I could talk to you about, it's a pretty beautiful project, right? <laughs> and we could talk through it in that way. But what I want to talk to you about is the, um, the process behind this. So, you know, uh, also much like here, there was a park of Carson jumped in. They've done a series of, of projects and in at least one of them, they, they came into a situation where the residents were not talking with the council. Um, there was such distrust. And, and so it was only through uh, very like authentic engagement that uh, the firm could gain the trust of residents. There was even things like, you know, going on a field trip to the brick factory so the residents could be involved in, in selecting bricks. And this is not just like a nice thing to do, but necessary and um, resulting in, in a project that actually serves the needs of the people who live there. And PS is pretty beautiful. Second category, uh, new forms of housing. Here we had a really beautiful article by some local architects, um, Niraj uh, and Ancha teach at uh, CCA, and Niraj was at Berkeley recently. So they, uh, they did a piece called Spatial Models for the Domestic Commons. Um, so in terms of new forms of housing, looking at potentials for collective housing, and what they argue is a, you know, a form of luxury for what they call the precariat or, you know, any of us who are sort of barely hanging on with the amount of money that we make and the housing prices. Um, so they did some really interesting, with their students, some really interesting studies going into the remaining communes of the San Francisco area. And then brought in some international examples like this NHGM project um, from Seoul. And I think it's interesting to think about not only, okay, how, how must the housing be designed to provide for, you know, collectivity and also privacy, but also what are the considerations um, in, the, in the city and here, you know, represented by the, the ground plane. Um, and so looking at those questions. So looking at, you know, what are new forms of housing, um, collective housing being new and old. Um, but revive perhaps forms of housing um, that can uh, lead to greater social equity. And last category is a new kind of architect. So I'm going quickly and just showing you again one example here. And here uh, going to Rwanda to Kigali, where uh, the you know two quite pressing issues are rapid urbanization and also supply chain issue where a lot of materials are, are brought in they're imported um, which you know increased costs and means that money is going to somewhere else right um, so this is you know i love this article it's by fatu da who she's actually from the Bay i think she's from berlin game i'm not sure but she's been in rwanda for a decade or so and um has been working uh, with the government and now with an ngo so she's been involved in producing this model, which she says is more of a, you know, less architecture, more a system. But she argues, looking at a new kind of architect, she argues that it's necessary, she's found, to be not just an architect, but an architect slash urban planner slash supply chain expert. 
So this is a project that as much, it's as much about designing the building as it is about designing the process. Um, uh, so this was the, the ribbon cutting, um, where this building or the set of buildings, the system is designed to be built using bricks produced by small and medium uh, enterprises uh, in Rwanda. So, so, you know, contributing to the local economy. So this is suggesting that, you know, architects to be uh, impactful really need to take on new kinds of knowledge, um, either through collaboration or, or directly. So, um, you know, I, I want to at this point introduce this quote that I think is really powerful. And if anyone has not read In Defense of Housing, please, you know, write a little note and order it immediately. It's such a good book. Um, so the, the built form of housing has always been seen as a tangible, visual reflection of the organization of society. It reveals existing class structure and power relationships. And this next slide is for the architects in the room, which might be everyone. Um, but it has also long been a vehicle for imagining alternative social orders. Um, so I'm quite interested in, in how our work, you know, no matter the scale, actually, maybe it's a studio apartment, maybe it's a multifamily building or even a neighborhood. Um, but how, how can this work um, help to promote, imagine, and, and push toward alternative social orders? So that's, that's the official end of, of the, the main material. Uh, but P.S., I want to offer, <laughs> I want to offer a, a provocation. Um, and this is back to the image I showed earlier from the tenement uh, competition. And what I'm showing is from uh, CCA. I don't know if you all saw this, but CCA did an Instagram project called Urbanism Beyond Corona. And I was one of the people invited, you know, commissioned to post to Instagram, which is a sort of funny thing. It's actually much more difficult than a normal commission, I think, because it's so, you know, it's so limited. Um, so I'll offer this. This is, this is sort of a messy, loose idea that I have that I put together for this. And I, I offer this as a provocation as we transition into the more interesting, the, the discussion part of all of this. Um, so this is, this is what I wrote for, for that. Um, governments are funding hotel rooms for those experiencing homelessness under COVID, acknowledging that the housing conditions we normally accept for the poor are unacceptable. Uh, Black Americans disproportionately live in unsheltered or overcrowded settings correlated with COVID risk. The pandemic has exposed inequities that every day contribute to shortened Black lives. Historically, advocates have used public health crises to secure increased living standards. Um, this is the part I talk with you a little bit. In the light, late 19th century in New York, for instance, uh, the tenement redesign pictured was codified into building code that provided residents with access to light and air. Housing justice is racial justice. Urbanism after Corona must reverse trends toward unaffordable microunits and instead provide decommodified permanent healthy homes for all. Um, accepted standards are unacceptable. And here are the footnotes there. Um, and um, and so here's the you know this was the y'all y'all can go on to Instagram after this and look up um, urbanism beyond Corona. Okay, so here we are. So I will stop talking now, I promise. Um, so we're back to this main slide. Um, yes, how, you know, I'm interested in, in whatever thoughts or questions you have on anything presented, but you know, I'm, I'm really interested to learn more about what's going on in my uh, sort of hometown, um, almost. And um, you know, what you're thinking about how architects can best promote uh, greater health equity and affordable housing for all. Thanks, Karen. That was wonderful. Really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I had a question to start it off with. Um, I had two questions, but I'll, I'll pick one of them. Oh, wait. And everyone, um, if I can see, can I request some faces? Can I see? 
anyone who's feeling, unless you're just looking terrible, um, would love to see everyone's faces. <laughs> Agree with that. Uh, oh, super <laughs> showing up. Uh, I guess my question is, so, you know, the Bay Area is a housing crisis, like most <clears> places, <throat> I guess like a lot of places. And the cost of housing here, as far as building it, is extremely expensive. And so, and like you said, this idea that you build 100 units and there's 10,000 people on the waiting list to get it. So all these people are kind of being left behind. So I feel like affordable housing projects are immensely important, but not the sole, um, at this point, there's not enough funding and it's not the sole way to solve the problem. So as far as, so that's, that's kind of the architecture side, right, is building buildings. I'm wondering if your research, you showed a lot of buildings, so I'm wondering if your research went into things outside of that. Like there's, there's, a, there's a whole network of things, right? There's the, um, you know, the, just where, where, where are you coming from and what, what have you found about other items of, of that network of helping homelessness and um, the poor who need housing? So other strategies beyond buildings? Correct. <laughs> is that, I mean, it's like, it's, it's what, like you said, like you get people into affordable housing, um, their quality of life goes up. You had that slide that had a lot of really great things that happened. But like, we're, we're, we're not going to get there. It's going to be, unless we have lots more funding, we're, we're never going to get to just housing everyone through affordable housing. Um, so are there other, are there other methods that architects can get involved in or that you have researched that um, help, you know, complete that network of people who are maybe being left behind or what other options are uh, that we can engage in? Yeah, so you're right. We're not going to get there unless there's a not, lot more funding. And so I think we need to fight for a lot more funding. <laughs> Um, you know, so I think, you know, what I talk about in the, in the book is that I'm presenting, you know, architects who I think are doing really phenomenal work within our current constraints and also pushing for new paradigms. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm really interested in the London example, right, because I think often, you know, let's say you come in here, <laughs> you know, when you go into a room of, of architects from the United States and you bring in like, I don't know, a Swedish example or something, right? That can be easily dismissed, you know, like, oh, you know, it's a totally different political system. Get out of my face. I can't do that. But looking at London, you know, they're especially coming from New York, right? There's so many similarities, right? Uh, culturally, politically, economically, um, really similar patterns of disinvestment and privatization of public housing, yet uh, they've started to build social housing again, right? So their story is crash happens, right? Crash, crash, <laughs> here and there, right? And um, also a, a story of stimulus. So so in, in the crash, this is, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit and I, you know, uh, someone from London would have more expertise, but um, uh, so the crash happens, uh, private development stalls and um, uh, starting, it starts small, you know, in boroughs like Hackney, they realize, you know what, we could, we meaning the council, we meaning the local government, we could do this. So they, they go back to, you know, it's been stalled for decades um, and, and they started with a little bit of stimulus and, um, and now they have a model, you know, there are different thoughts on this, whether this is the right way to go or not, but what they have now is a cross subsidized model for new social housing development. Um, so that means that in the image uh, pictured and then I think all the projects that Car Cruz Carson is involved in. Um, there's a production of social housing or their version of public housing, and on the same site there's private housing. So it it's just like um, uh, it's it's just like any other development, except the developer is is the state, right, or the or the borough, 
So um, not only is it self-sustaining, but they're actually making money that's going back into public coffers and um, uh, promoting more public investment. Um, so, so, so I agree, we're not gonna get there unless we really shift paradigms. And we're certainly in a moment where, you know, it's wild to me and, and amazing that we're seeing things like the Green New Deal for public housing being taken uh, seriously. Um, and of course, this is all connected if we're talking about funding. Um, this is highly connected to conversations about defunding uh, the police, right? So, so yes, I agree. Um, and then if you're wanting sort of, okay, yes, that's too big, Karen, but <laughs> you know, what can we do uh, tomorrow? I think, um, you know, there, there are many different, I'm trying to think, um, you know, I think those, I'll, I'll sort of go back to my three categories, right? Um, collaborative approaches, new forms of housing, and a new kind of architect. Um, so, oh yes, I'll answer, I'll answer Sasha's question. I don't want you to be totally uh, lost. Um, so, so I think all of those approaches have, have a role in, in addressing uh, social equity. And I really wanna stop talking. So, so maybe I'll, <laughs> just, to, just to address uh, Sasha's question. Um, so this is all, you know, it's all connected, of course, right? And um, we've seen, uh, you know, a steep drop off in, in funding for housing at the federal level, for instance, right? I think we're at something like a third of funding levels from the 1970s, right? Um, yet, you know, military spending is, is quite high. Um, so I think when we look at uh, you know, a big question is how do we get more funding for housing? Um, I'm offering the suggestion that this, this is all connected. So, um, you know, current movements for defunding the police um, might result in, in more funding being available for things like affordable housing that can contribute to social equity. Sasha, does that answer your question about how I'm thinking about the connection? Okay, cool. Okay, can I stop talking now? <laughs> you wanna address uh, Karen's question? Or Karen's? Um, uh, um, can I, I really, I will, but I really just really want other people to talk for a second. <laughs> um, please, I'm so I, sick of my own voice. I'd like to actually jump in a little bit and uh, uh, speak to something you talked about in the project in Rwanda, which was the architect that kind of considered themselves to be um, like a systems uh, organizer or systems engineer in a way. Because I think that's a really interesting way to think about architects that we often don't. And I think it's really too bad because I think our training and, and our practice really you know, allows that. And, and I don't think enough of us really grab onto it as a way to kind of claw back more power from other areas that we could then use to our own devices, if you will. I don't know if anybody else has, a, has thoughts on that. I just think it's a really interesting idea that I think we don't kind of tackle or take on or, or, or promote enough amongst ourselves outwards. Um, I'm happy to talk to that comment. Um, this is Ursula. So I just came back from two years of working in Malawi as an architect. And um, I was in remote parts of the country. And what was interesting to me is that um, I, when I would go to remote communities, people were making the bricks. You know, they organized themselves to build their own buildings because they recognized the uh, need for schools, latrines, etc. And um, this is, I think everything that's been touched on today makes me understand the complexity of what we're trying to address here because while it was great, the community actually didn't need architects. What I saw, they, you know, the husbands and wives got together, they built the schools for their kids, they built dormitories. But to build the bricks, they were deforesting their land. And um, it was given rise to huge problems. So the government stepped in and said, no more brick production. We can't afford to have any more deforestation. 
and instead people learned how to do concrete bricks. Um, they shut down the, the industry, um, the wood industry, and so the local people were up in arms. So they set fire to the forests because they couldn't, you know, get access to the wood. Um, anyway, so that's a, it's a complex issue, you know. So I really appreciate everything that's been addressed today. And I realize the solutions take a lot of thought process and really understanding what communities are like to know what are appropriate solutions for that particular for particular issues. So that's just my two cents for the moment. Yeah, I think that's key is like where like yeah addressing what's in particular of the location because you should, Karen you showed the example of the project in Argentina or Brazil wherever the, the one where you can build the rest of your house later, right? You Chile. build part of it. Thank you, Julie. Um, and I just can't imagine that model working in America where uh, there's just so many regulations to be able to finish your house, right? You provide half of it, which is awesome. You get a cheaper piece. You can build on as your family grows or as your needs grow. Um, but it's kind of renegade in a way, right? It's like it's, it's, it, when they have been filled those pieces, you know, it's really the family building their own little thing. And that just like, to get building permits for it. You gotta wait a year for them to review. You gotta go through planning for it. It's just like the process in America, even though it's a super interesting model for that area, it's just, I just can't imagine it being replicated here. But I, I just jump in to say, but it, it has been replicated here. We used to do it, right? Like Milwaukee is yeah, we don't. a housing type called a core flat, which is basically was a one story house that, that was built cheaply. And then, you know, when the family gathered enough money, they raised the house and built another floor underneath and, you know, doubled their space or, you know, were able to rent it out to provide a little income for themselves. So it's not that it can't be done here. It's just that it can't be done here anymore, maybe, you know. Well, when I lived in Vermont, we, everyone worked on their own house. I, I would say that it, particularly, I, I think that this can be attributed to different regional areas. And I, for some reason, we've lost that do-it-yourself notion around housing here maybe i mean maybe that's that could be a positive result of all the unemployment in this country is people could learn how to work on their own home again um who knows but there are a lot there's now we're gonna what are they saying 15 to 20 percent unemployment over the next year or two potentially um there's a lot of infrastructure there's a lot of housing this country needs um I think it's unfortunate that, like you're saying, Brian, in, in my experience of practicing here, it's nearly impossible to get someone to do work on their own home. Yeah, I think that's really Great. interesting. You know, I'm certainly not suggesting that um, a Chilean model should be dropped into Oakland. Um, you know, these are these are local examples, um, and um, maybe if I have a moment, I'll. There was an amazing podcast. There's a podcast called in Interstitial, and. Um, Someone, Helen, I'm blanking on her last name. Uh, there's a woman who's just written a brilliant book on uh, critiquing uh, self-help housing. Um, so I'll, if I can find that, I'll put the link in there. Um, but I'll address um, Karen's uh, comment uh, where she's asking, you know, about supply chain engagement. And I should say, you know, just to clarify for the Rwandan example, I showed one building, but it's it's um. It's a series, it's a whole scheme. <laughs> um, it's an idea to, to replicate that quite a lot. Um, and um, I'm not as much of an expert in, in those specific issues, but another thing I'm interested in is, of course, you know, looking at the environmental aspects and thinking about, um, you know, all the work toward um, wood, you know, building, building in wood. And um, I have an article in the book that's looking at um, work coming from Yale that looks at regional forests, looking at, uh, again, local economies, um, more environmentally sustainable methods, um, putting all these things together, thinking at, at different scales at once. Um, and I might, I would be really interested. So, you know, I miss California. I'm not that far away anymore, but I can't get there right now. Um, so I'm really, 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 really interested to hear from you all you know, how is this resonating with what's going on locally? You know, what you are already doing, what's feeling more urgent now? Um, 
so what are you, you know, and we've thrown out some thoughts about supply chain, about funding, about design, about collaboration. Um, and, you know, we're obviously seeing, we've been seeing huge inequities, racial, social inequities for a very long time, of course, but these are becoming even more urgent now. Um, so, so yeah, who wants to share, um, who wants to be the first to share something they're working on or something that they are, are wanting to, to push for? <laughs> Allie, are you about to talk? I can be brave. Um, I am uh, a designer and architect who actually just moved down here from Seattle um, right before, moved down to Oakland right before the pandemic started, um, and specifically to work on ADU housing as infill housing. So I work with the design build and I'm doing a lot of little projects around the area. And so I just, as I have everybody online, I, I'm really curious what the general thought and feeling is about ADU housing right now in this moment. Um, and as an option for smaller homeowners to basically take a little bit of control from the developers is infill housing and, and the kind of politics. And if anybody has, I'm, I'm in a very curious and open-minded space at the, at the moment. So I'm just curious if anybody has thoughts about that currently. Well, I'm happy to speak to this a little bit. Um, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Tyler. Um, so we, my firm, we do a ton of ADUs and uh, probably get call, phone calls for them um, maybe two or three times a day. Yeah. Wow. And, um, and they're extremely popular, as you might be aware, Karen, right now in the Bay Area because they're one of the few things that has had red tape removed from, their, um, uh, from the process of, of executing them. And in fact, they're almost all now considered generally over the counter um, in the zoning department and even further density of them on sites has been recently allowed by um, Newsom and prior bills from uh, Newsom on October 31st came into law on January 1st and then prior bills from Jerry Brown in the prior years. And it's one of the few building code, one of the few building code elements that I'm aware of where actually um, uh, red tape has been removed in the last few years. So they're, 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 they're happening everywhere, but the problem is they still cost a whole lot of money to build per square foot, at least 500 a square foot, I'd say, which is still much cheaper than typical affordable housing buildings, which can be 900 to 1,000 square foot easily. Um, uh, so, I mean, in that regard, their cost to society is quite a bit less. Um, and they're actually using quite unused land that could uh, um, that people need to activate anyway. Um, so for me, I, I don't know. We think they're a relatively good solution to some housing, but because of their initial cost, uh, we're finding at least my firm is finding them only built in the higher rent areas anyway. And so, for instance, here in East Oakland, where I live, where I think it's half the land mass of Oakland. Um, we have, we barely see any commissions come from this area because people can't afford the upfront cost of at least a quarter million dollars to build them. Yeah, and I'll just um, second that, Tyler, on the, the lack of red tape. I've, um, I've been recently commissioned to a d designer couple just in the last month or two, really. And uh, everybody I'm talking to about it is just like, it's just so easy to permit. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to builders who are like, I'm moving to constructing ADUs solely, so I don't have to deal with the red tape of doing anything, adding on to a house or anything like that. So I think it's a, it's a really big driver. And I think what it points to is that it's, you know, we need to do this with other aspects of building as well, to some degree, and, and allow more freedom uh, to experiment and do different things and, and not tie up the process or tie up the building in so much process. Yeah, I cut it from the presentation because I wanted to keep it short, but in the book we have um, a, a beautiful article by Dana Cuff um, of UCLA City Lab, who's been, a, she's been obsessed in a good way with ADUs for 10 years, and you may know that she's trained as an architect and she was actually one of the authors of the 2017 legislation that made it easier to build um, accessory dwelling units statewide. Um, yeah, so thank you for 
sharing that, Ali, who has something else that they're working on that they think, you know, uh, is, is contributing to uh, spatial justice? mention one or two things. This is Victor Rubin from Policy Link. Hi, Karen, how are you? Um, I'm also serving a stint on the board of directors of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, and I might like to ask you a little bit later if you've had some teaching experience that, that you can share that talks about spatial justice and the issues you raised tonight with the, with the students, because um, I think that's going to be very, very much a growing thing. My observation about the housing crisis would be actually ironic in the sense that things have gotten so bad that a very wide range of activists are not interested in production very much at all because they are focused 100% on preservation and protection of low income tenants. And many of the usual coalitions you see between, say, nonprofit housing developers. Uh, for-profit developers working in uh, moderate income and mixed income communities and other housing advocates focused on the needs of low-income families, immigrant families, supportive housing. It's gotten to the point where it's hard to build a coalition around uh, production of new units. People are far more interested in, and I don't think these are bad, I think they're absolutely essential, preventing speculation, taking large amounts as much of uh, property out of the private and speculative market in places like the Bay Area as possible. And then the current um, uh, crisis or pandemic leads to a need and necessity to focus almost exclusively on rent moratoriums, uh, mortgage moratoriums, rent cancellation. It's going to be a while before we can even get back to what we, if we ever get back to what we thought of as a normal uh, ray of constituents for building affordable housing, um, let alone experimenting with new ideas. But hopefully this cracks open a lot of the stalemates as well. But, but I, I find it harder to get folks to focus on building and on production and on overcoming the massive gap at the low income level, even mm -hmm. just because of the overwhelming needs of low income tenants and homeless folks. Right, because there's so much urgent need right in front of us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it may end up changing the politics of finance and regulation for affordable housing in, in some important ways, but I'm not, I'm not sure anybody sees their way through to what that looks like yet. It's ironic because money is so cheap, you think this would be the best opportunity to get relatively more built than at other times. So it's too bad. If you don't mind, I, I don't know if it changes the subject too much, but have you had, have you been teaching and is there, a, a, are there any observations you have about social justice and spatial justice teaching for architecture students? That's I mean, I'm, my background is in, in, in planning, so it's, it's a, you know, it's a very different environment there, curriculum wise and expectations. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I mean, you're bringing up all the things I cut out of our presentation. <laughs> I keep it short. Uh, all the things I, I I tuned in for it, so. <laughs> um, Karen is my colleague um, at the University of Oregon and is also doing, I mean, her work was just, maybe I can find um, um, the link, her work uh, from, was your studio called Just City? Remind me of the name of your studio, Karen. Oh, it was Just City, Just Future. And um, to maybe your point, uh, is it, uh, Victor, um, several of the students, this, this is a capstone studio, the final studio for graduates and undergraduates at the University of Oregon, it was an urban design and architecture studio. And in the exit interviews, um, the vast majority, I won't say every student mentioned this, but the vast majority of the students told me that it was the framing of the studio and the specific focus on the design, um, you know, of uh, really focused on uh, repair uh, to a neighborhood that had been harmed by uh, racist infrastructure and then the design of a center for democracy and environmental justice that that was what brought them to the studio the opportunity to spend um, 
six months very intensively and nine months focused on those issues and having a chance to learn about them. Also, also interestingly, interestingly, almost all of them told me it was the first time that they had talked about any of those issues in their five years or three and a half years of education. Mm -hmm. Have you guys had a chance to share the experience with faculty at other schools through ACSA or anything else? Or would you might possibly be interested in doing that? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. So it's just, you know, it's been a whirlwind, right? It's been, this is the first year of the program and uh, there was a, I don't know if you've heard, there's a pandemic. And so we all went online and it's been pretty wild. Uh, so I just put in the chat um, two links. One is to um, the first page um, links to uh, some videos related to the spatial justice initiative. Um, and then just because we were referencing self-help housing earlier, I highly recommend it's only like 11 minutes. So, you know, any of us has we tend to spend for that. I hope this, um, Helen Geiger is her name. She's a genius. Um, so yeah, I'll share a couple of things that I had the chance to work on. Um, I, I, I taught uh, two studios over the course of the year. Um, one was called uh, Rebuilding Cornerstones uh, toward um, uh, racial justice for Portland's Black diaspora. Um, and, um, you know, I've been to Portland a lot of times, but, you know, I think often it's before moving here, but I think often it's thought of as a white city. Um, that's not true. I mean, it's, it's more white than some other cities, but um, of course, there, you know, there are a lot of people of color that have been um, displaced. Uh, the, you know, the amount of environmental racism here is um, really astounding, even compared to the sorry state of affairs across our country. Um, so I did a, a studio in collaboration with some amazing artists named Cleo Davis and Kayeen Davis that was cited in, I think probably, I have to look at where exactly yours was, Karen, um, but cited in the Albina neighborhood, which is a historically a black neighborhood in, in Portland, um, but has seen, you know, there's been so much displacement. Um, so we were working on a project that is actually you know, a lot that's owned by my colleagues. And it was a project looking at affordable housing. Uh, the story for the lot is um, they fought, they went and looked at historical records and they got it rezoned so that it could allow up to six stories of development and allow not only residential, but also commercial. Um, so really looking at economic justice as a part of this. Um, and then another piece to make it as complicated as possible in 10 weeks was um, they saved, there was uh, down the street, there was a Victorian home that was slated for demolition. They got it saved. They got it moved to the site. So that will become, uh, that'll be, you know, it's a, it's a historic preservation project. Well, that will become a cultural center called the, um, the archive, uh, uh, an archive of black histories and futures. Um, so the students were doing proposals, um, and I think there are some images in that. I'll find another link where you can see a little bit of stuff from that studio. Um, but it was foregrounding racial justice and economic justice, and um, we worked not only with these artists who have been active in Albina for decades, but also actually with kids. It was this amazing thing where we had um, uh, kids from uh, local elementary schools and, and high schools who were with us every Wednesday. So you literally had like eight-year-olds working next to 25-year-olds and it was a different uh, approach to community engagement where yes, you know, we went into the neighborhood, yes, every time there was a review there were a lot of people uh, from different perspectives who were involved, but then literally, you know, sitting side by side with kids who were uh, our clients in a way and being new to the city I said oh so these are kids from Albina and I was schooled on that and told no there's been so much displacement that these um, kids of color don't live there anymore but their parents and their grandparents did so the the kids were learning their own histories alongside with our grad and undergrad students and um, and then you know instead of feeding them Corbusier and Cool House and whatever, um, the, of being very intentional in the presence we were looking at, looking at Afrofuturism, looking at um, some students looked at new architecture, 
Um, so, so bringing in those examples, um, and I don't want to talk too long, so I won't talk about it too much, but then this, this last quarter I did a project in the Jade District, which is um, the neighborhood with the highest percentage of Asian Americans, and I was working in collaboration with an environmental justice group. We're really following the lead of, uh, you know, the people most impacted, and, um, and again, you know, making the work culturally specific. So, so I'll try to find one more <laughs> link, um, but I think it's really critical, as Karen is saying, I think um, students are incredibly hungry for, for this kind of work, um, you know, and, and I had a couple of them kind of call me, I felt like, I, I don't know about you, Karen, we're having this conversation like, <laughs> we should have had coffee, but we're having it here. Um, I'm sure I'd be curious if there are other teachers on the line. Um, but, you know, if they're literally, I mean, especially students in Eugene, right, our, our final was like four days after protests broke out, right? So they're literally having tear gas. Uh, if they're not in the streets, then tear gas is wafting into their apartments. And, and so then does their education feel relevant? Um, and I had students who were, I've played kind of guidance counselor and therapist, right? Students calling me and almost not quite crying, but almost crying, right? Thinking about, um, you know, how, how do I, you know, how are we relevant as architects? Um, so that's, that's just a teaser on some of the work. And I know that we're all working on now that we've finished it, packaging it and thinking about sharing it at ACSA. Thank and you. Thank you very much. Yeah, please do um, be in touch if you want. I've been on a diversity, equity, and inclusion leadership committee for ACSA, and I've been following it as a, an amateur, the curriculum discussions, which as you say, were hard enough before everything had to go online. But I think people would be very interested in it. Yeah. So I'd love to hear what else, you know, is going on in the Bay Area and, you know, to this point about how there are, you know, there are massive constraints now and um, we need a lot more money and political will um, to, to get toward actual health equity, toward racial equity. Um, so what else are people, what, what else are people working on or, or thinking about or, or fighting for and how are you seeing, what connections locally are you seeing between, you know, the work that you're going to be doing, what day is it, Thursday, <laughs> tomorrow, Friday in your offices and these larger pushes for defunding police, et cetera. What, you know, what are you seeing on the ground or what are you wanting to see on the ground? I'll talk just to uh, anyone else. All right, I'll talk. Um, I think overall the Bay Area has an immensely high quality affordable housing program. They have a really smart, um, dedicated organizations who, you know, after the 60s and this mass renovation or demolition of neighborhoods that happened, there was a reaction throughout the Bay Area to really produce high quality housing, affordable housing. Uh, so we've worked on several of them in San Francisco, we're working on one right now at um, the site of the old Trans Bay Terminal. Um, and that one's gonna be 45% affordable. So it's 500 units of housing and 45% of that will be affordable. Uh, so what's interesting about that one, I think, is that there's a 192 uh, unit affordable housing project on one side of the site. And there's a 550 foot tower on the other side of the site that's mixed with high end condos at the top and then a mix of affordable and market rates and in the bottom half of the tower. And it's really creating this huge community. But what's been difficult on it, I think, for the developer, it's Mercy Housing, is the affordable housing developer. Um, is that they haven't done a project of that size before. 192 units of, of, of 192 unit affordable housing project is a big building for them to manage. Um, and they've done a lot of affordable housing in the Bay Area. Uh, so there's like this thing where, so they have this funding, they're doing it, but they're, they're, you know, they still don't know exactly how it's gonna work. Um, you know, 150 for family units is kind of their prime 
um, number for a maximum amount of a family unit of affordable. Um, so I think that that project's super interesting because it, it's going to happen. Um, but you know, there's still, and I like the idea of this community of you get this mixed of, of pretty much of San Francisco, where you have uh, low income people, you have high end people, and then you have these kind of um, middle class people all living in one block, uh, downtown San Francisco. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that community develops um, and how the interaction between all those people happens when it actually gets developed. Um, but I think it's a pretty interesting example of, of kind of making a community on site. Brian, are there so are are you are you a are you a designer on that project at your firm? We're doing the 192 unit all affordable project, and SCB is doing the 550 foot tower. And and it, so are are there specific interventions that you found that are different because of the mixed character of of the entirety of the project, where you all looking at either crossover moments or or specific spaces that are intended for intermingling and cross communication. And can you explain Absolutely. what we talked about it those early, spaces are like? Yeah we, yeah, we talked about that early on, like this idea of everyone come to the same lobby, right? Things like that. I know one wants the corridor, but for management, for Mercy, they kind of wanted to be able to lock down their building and not have a lot, all the cross mingling. So like you couldn't have all of those units coming to the same area. So um, what, we, what we have done is we have a raised courtyard. It's on the second floor. The community room, offices um, all open up from the affordable housing project onto that courtyard. The courtyard is shared between the tower and ours. We also have a fitness center, which is not typical in affordable housing projects. That's actually in the tower. Um, uh, just because there's a affordable, uh, the the market rate typically has amenities that the affordable housing projects don't have, uh, so those are being shared. So this courtyard is going to be that mixing where you have people coming from the affordable housing project entering into the tower, having the fitness center, having other amenities that are up on the on the twelfth floor. Um, that uh, I think will start to interact. The one thing that I think that don't that people that don't interact maybe. Yeah, aren't uh, directly as interactive is the high-end condos, which have their own amenity floor, their own elevator uh, to get up to the top. Um, but as far as the affordable and the both the bottom of the tower and the market rate of the tower and the affordable, I think there will be these these interactions of, of the community. There's also a big park that's um, going to be built right out in front of it, um, which is one of the only I think the only park in the Trans Bay District. Um, so I think that, you know, that whole, the whole Trans Bay neighborhood is going to be uh, kind of centered around that park. So um, I think that those, those, those mixing will happen. If it's okay, I want to share just one more um, reference point um, because I'm, I think, well, and maybe I'll just say as a parenthetical, I once, um, I've done a lot of research on low rise and density housing and I did an exhibition um, uh, an international exhibition and I was so frustrated because I was trying to make have an even set of uh, projects from across the country but you know California had the best projects over and over again so I ended up just you know cutting out the rest so so of course there's like amazing um, I agree there's like phenomenal work um, coming out of the west coast for a long time now um, but if you'll indulge me I just want to this was, I'm sure everyone did their reading, right? Yeah, this was um, one of the links. Um, so I think, you know, I'm just, I'm gonna sort of come back to this again, thinking about, um, you know, whether this can be a moment to raise standards. And I think this is an interview, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Community Solutions, a phenomenal organization that is committed to ending homelessness in the United States and maybe even in the world. Um, so this is an interview between Roseanne Haggerty, the director of the organization, and um, let's see, uh, Dame Louise Casey. Um, so, you know, much like here, looking at, okay, uh, COVID hits and um, they talk about um, the message to get everyone in, right? Um, and um, 
you all will be more expert than I on what's happened locally in terms of temporary provision. Um, and then, but I think this is the important part. I, I mean, that's important also, but, but looking at, okay, well, what's the connection between, uh, you know, this, this, um, this moment where more people are realizing that the standards um, that are normally accepted for people uh, with lower incomes, you know, realizing those are not acceptable. So, so this is really important, right? Uh, a worker who's working on a project to find long-term homes for those now in temporary accommodations um, and, and looking at, yes, it needs, you know, here's some money, um, thinking about um, how to make that happen. So I don't, I won't go through the whole um, article, but I'm, I'm curious uh, specifically as where, I think, how much more time do we have, like 10 more minutes? That's about right, yep. Yeah, so I'm curious, you know, um, I'm seeing those of you who, let's see, there's Ali and Annie and Tola, anyone who's not spoken yet or anyone who has, um, what you're thinking about um, whether you see a chance to build on um, momentum or uh, make connections between architecture and the larger political movements happening now. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, my name is Tola. I work at Design Justice. We're a nonprofit architecture and real estate development firm in Oakland, California. Um, our work is focused around um, addressing the root causes of mass incarceration and the effects it's kind of had in a lot of our communities. And uh, what's uh, especially um, on the burner right now for our work is trying to provide um, communities and different policymakers with um, tools to help them understand um, different ways to uh, think about um, divesting funds from like current um, criminal justice systems and reinvesting them back in the community. Um, so um, some of our projects are looking at ways to help divert folks from um, entering uh, the prison population and also um, helping them get back on their feet once they um, get out. So uh, one project in particular that's kind of um, uh, relevant to some of the um, some of the things we brought up today about um, the expensive cost of housing in the Bay Area is like how do you provide this transitional supportive housing in a in a climate that it's really expensive to um, build. So uh, one project that we're kind of prototyping right now is what we're calling like a a mobile refuge room, which is kind of like a um, it's like a pop-up bedroom to provide uh, supportive housing to folks who um, honestly don't have a place to go after they get out, which is um, really pressing right now is uh, a lot of counties are looking to uh, release folks to kind of uh, mitigate uh, COVID that's running rampant in some of the jails. So um, like, where do these people go? Like they, sometimes they don't have any families to go back to. So we're looking at, um, kind of mass uh, producing these uh, mobile refuge homes um, that um, can be easily deployed in um, existing um, infrastructure that's not being used right now. So uh, one place we were looking at that is uh, um, a defunct charter school in East Oakland. Um, so you have like these large spaces that um, don't require a ton of, um, a ton of, a ton of work to get it to fit these uh, pop-up pop -up bedrooms. And um, it's just uh, really um, interesting seeing that uh, project uh, progress over the past year since um, we did some uh, community engagement with uh, folks who were actually um, recently released from uh, prison and just asked them like, what are, their, what, have, what are things that they're seeing in their current uh, transitional supportive housing that they would um, want to improve? So we worked with them to kind of develop this prototype of this, uh, this kind of like, um, like a IKEA flat pack bedroom that can easily be deployed in uh, different situations. So that's just kind of how we're trying to look at uh, providing um, supportive housing in a, in a climate where it's really expensive to build a lot of these um, uh, low income housing, especially in the Bay Area. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm a massive admirer of your, um, your organization's work. Um, where can people, What's the best way for people to engage with that project? Is there more information or ways to support it or, or do you have a link or? 
Um, sure, I can uh, put the link to our um, website on there. We have more information about that project as well as other um, kind of prototypes for addressing mass incarceration in our country and in, in there. So um, if, if you guys want to take a look, uh, we're, um, we've been getting a lot of, uh, um, it's, it's been, a, I, th I think this moment in American history is like really um, opened our eyes to a lot of the harm that has been um, done in our communities and how we've been kind of like designing our communities because our the infrastructure that people live in is really, um, it, it really tells a lot about like where our focus has been as a society. So this moment in history has been a, a opening time for us to um, try to undo a lot of this harm. So I'll, I'll put the link to um, our firm's work in there and you guys can uh, take a look. Thank you. Mm. To be kind of on that a little bit, hi everybody. Um, I'm Annie, I, uh, I'm an architect, but I also work for a community developer and affordable housing developer. Um, and just thinking about the need for permanent supportive, you know, affordable housing. And it's just so expensive. Um, but what is our role? We, um, what we're given as projects, but become advocates for, you know, the, the, in this moment of systemic change, how can we um, push for housing justice as racial justice? Uh, and if we can find the funds to put people in hotel right now, um, we can fund these projects that are already in the pipeline that, are, that developers have ready to roll. It's just, um, you know, usually it's the city is the very first bit of money that needs to go in before a project can get off the ground. And that is something that us as citizens and us as architects as a group um, can advocate for really directly to our city, to our council members, um, because there is money out there. Uh, and uh, there's also a, such a moment of income inequality that there's money in the Bay Area. We, and there's some stat is like staggering, something like in the last year, there's like 2,200 permitted units that were uh, approved in the city of Oakland, and only something like 100 of them are affordable. So it's like a tiny, tiny fraction of like the things that are getting built are, that are affordable, and we can do it. And there are so many people that are ready to design and build it. It's just that we need that political pressure and the political will. And as a group of architects, I think we can, we can push for those things that we believe in, that housing improves people's lives and that is a racial issue and we are a part of it. Um, so thank you for this conversation, Karen. I think that's a great way to end. Um, I think you're right. Uh, so thank you for everyone who joined us. Um, hope you continue to join us uh, monthly the third Thursday of every month here at the East Bay in the Regional Urban Design Forum. And I think this will be shared on our website, the East Bay website. Uh, so if you want to share it with your friends, uh, please do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Karen. We well, appreciate you joining us. Sure thing. And I'm just going to put, if anyone wants to be in touch, I'm just putting my info um, in the thing. Um, I love, yeah, I love what Annie said at the end. Um, anyway, <laughs> I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's like direct, you know, does anyone have a, you know, I don't even live in the East Bay, but I'm wondering if anyone's like moved by this, if anyone has a direct thought for, for how people can get involved in uh, political pressure, I'm curious. So that people don't just go off into the ether. I don't know. <laughs> That's great. We talk about it a lot. Like you know, the AI East Bay is eight hundred and uh, the AI East Bay is eight hundred and fifty members. I mean, that's 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 good, right? I mean, that's a, that's a big variety of people uh, who have influence. Um, and um, yeah, but how do you take it to the next level? I think uh, and really influence it. I think is the difficult part that um, we got to figure out. And there's thousands of organizations, I mean, literally thousands of organizations in the, in the East Bay who are, are doing this, uh, you know, developing those relationships with those people um, and really figuring out how to do it is, um, is glad that there's 
such motivation to do it and uh, a lot of people trying to do it. So I uh, just maybe concentrating all these people together and having not these separate organizations would be uh, or working together to really conquer the, the goals. Sounds good. All right, I'm going to drop off. Yep. All okay. right. Well, thank you all. Karen, thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Have a great Bye. night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.